Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the impact of GNSS band radio interference on operational avionics published in the fall 2022 issue of Navigation, the journal of the Institute of Navigation. Today's webinar will be presented by two of the paper's authors, Dr. Michael Felix and Dr. Oquario Seches. Dr. Michael Felix is a senior lecturer for CNS and ATM and group leader of the infrastructure team at the Center for Aviation at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Dr. Felix received a PhD in aerospace engineering in 2018 from the Technical University of Munich, Germany. Okwari Oseches is a researcher at the German Aerospace Center, known as DLR. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from Tufts University in 2014, where his thesis focused on integrity monitoring for GBAS. Okwari is a member of the Iowan Council and is very happy to be doing an Iowan webinar. You can download this paper and many more on the Navigation Open Access website at navi.ion.org. The website has tools that allow you to read, download, cite, and share valuable research content such as this paper. So thank you for being here. And now we'll turn it over to the stars of our show, Michael and Okwa. Thank you very much, Rick, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good night from wherever you're joining us. Thanks for uh, being here with us in this webinar. First of all, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the co-authors of this paper we're presenting. Um, that's uh, Okwari, myself, and uh, Friederike Fulmeister and Thomas Dautermann from DLR. I'll also be some uh, showing some additional information and later on about the current situation from uh, two of my colleagues, Benoit Figuet and uh, Patrick Fohl here at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. So, Whoop. If you're anything like me, um, you're always ready for the next vacation. And um, at least when you live here in Europe, Cyprus is a very popular destination. Uh, it's beautiful beaches uh, located in the Southern Mediterranean, good food, mostly nice weather. So eventually you might decide to just hop on a plane and uh, fly there uh, to spend a few relaxing weeks uh, at the beach. And um, as you sit on the plane and uh, enjoy the beautiful scenery and your knees start to hurt because of the little leg room you have. Um, you might remember that here at the ION, you saw a webinar not so long ago, maybe in February by Todd Humphreys. And he uh, told us some uh, frightening stuff about uh, jamming and, and spoofing that, that happens exactly over there somewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, as you get closer to your destination, you start maybe getting worried and uh, wonder if your flight crew still knows where they're going and um, will they be able to get you to your beach destination in Cyprus safely. And it's highly likely that the crew of your flight might have received um, so-called NODAMs, that is um, pre-flight information as part of uh, the briefing every, uh, every flight crew gets. And um, that, that looked something like this. And this was actually an old time we had when we were flying there, as Okwari will be telling you in, in just a minute. But um, it talks about GPS signal interruptions, but there are also uh, no times about military flights. Um, the French Navy is down there. The British Navy is active down there. There is some uh, Russian Navy exercise with uh, rocket test firing. So it's really, uh, yeah, an interesting piece of airspace to say the least. And uh, these were all no temps that were active um, back in 2020. But if you're wondering, um, I just checked that the situation hasn't changed. These are today's no temps. And you still have the Russian Navy exercises with firing, uh, Navy gun firing. So in these areas, you might um, actually want your navigation to be absolutely impeccable and uh, better stay out of trouble. And uh, so with this, I would like to hand over to a quarry who would tell you uh, more about um, our little holiday trip we did. Thank you, Michi. That looks really scary, that yeah, one right. on the right. So let's see if this works as planned. Can I move forward? Yeah. Yes. So the question that drove um, our curiosity at the time is what actually happens to an airplane that meets radio frequency interference. What, you know, does the navigation just kind of go dark? What happens, you 
know, does it get confused? Does it, what, what does it do? So um, we took a ride. We flew to Larnaca Airport in Cyprus. Um, this happened to be um, Michael's birthday, February 13th, 2020. He had a lot of fun that day, as did I. Um, and we were acting basically on this NOTAM in the general knowledge that GPS signal interruptions are being reported in separate airspace. So what we went to visit is what is called um, the Nicosia Flight Information Region. And you can see the boundary in red. That's all of that area inside that red boundary is um, Nicosia FIR. And so um, we took our proudest bird, the, our Airbus 320, and took it for a spin. So the webinar will have basically two parts. First, I will describe our flight. We'll talk a little bit about what we saw in the cockpit and what kind of measurements we were able to derive from the onboard instrumentation. And then Michael will discuss his analysis of flight tracking data that he's done since. And he will also make a, an excursion into how things have changed since that uh, singularity in February of 2022. So of course, the first thing you do before you go on a on a special flight like this is the first thing we did is we went to the to the tower at Larnaca Airport, and we discussed the NOTAMs with them, military flights. Of course, um, our pilots knew about this. Um, we, we, you know, all the NOTAMs are part of the pre-flight briefing. But um, what what we were able to get from the from the controllers is also a sense for how does this impact them? And they say, well, you know, not everybody reads the, pre the pre-flight information because there is so much of it. And actually, if you go look at Cypri and NOTAMs, they are very interesting political documents where you have Northern Cyprus and Southern Cyprus issuing contradicting NOTAMs. And um, it's all over the, uh, you know, if, if you're into that, it's all over the internet, of course, like so many things. Um, it can be very confusing and pilots come in maybe unaware of the difficulties they will encounter. And it can lead to situations where there needs to be a go around, or they miss the approach, things can happen. Uh, they're not an acute risk to operational safety, but it would be much better if these things didn't happen. So our question was, how do you actually find RFI? That was actually, for me, that was a bit of an anxious moment. So where do we go now? You know, we've got this really nice aircraft. It's, we actually had quite a bit of colleagues as crew. So, you know, you were spending a lot of resource on this one flight. Where do we go? Well, we start, what we did was, let me see, is this the animation? Oh, yeah, because of course, um, you, you know that there is RFI, but RFI could be coming from anywhere unless you've got specialized equipment. It's hard to locate, right? So the first thing that we did is we flew southwest. Um, we did a bit of a banking maneuver just to see what's going on and start flying due east because the assumption was that the interference is coming from the east. And clearly, you can see in the track, we found something and started exploring it a little bit to let really the, let the interference um, act on the receivers on the airplane. And we fly back due north, and uh, before um, uh, before final approach and landing, we do a bit more circling um, to explore some more. And now the question is, uh, how do you actually know you found RFI? Because that's also not super super straightforward or immediate. Um, we spent enough time with our airplane in the in the interference that we started getting things like um, fault warnings from the GPS receivers, and we saw things like um, GPS primary loss, which, you know, I found that a bit scary, honestly. Um, Michael has some more information as to other things that can happen on the, on the flight deck that are even more scary. Um, what we have available as hardware is um, the base aircraft, of course, is like any other Airbus 320 of that generation. It's, it's a little dated, to be, to be frank, but um, it's still valid. It's still certified. Um, in addition, so that, that comes with a multi-mode receiver made by Collins Aerospace, GLU-920. In addition, we have an experimental um, multi-mode receiver. That's a newer version of the 920, 925. Um, we have a commercial high-quality GNSS receiver, Javal Delta, 
and we also have a high fidelity um, recording device um, that has the ability um, of sampling in phase and quadrature. And that's very helpful for a posteriori analysis of, of the signals. So part of the problem is that you don't really know you found RFI until you've had it for a while. So I, I'll, I'll just remind you, we start from Larnaca, we fly Southwest, we start flying due East. And it isn't under some curving around that we get this message, GPS primary lost. Now, if you're very careful and you know what to expect, there are ways of, of knowing much earlier than be before you get this message. But what was really surprising to me after we flew and when we started looking at the data is where we really had GPS available. And that's on taxi, takeoff, maybe a little bit of departure, final approach, and landing. Really in the air, we didn't really have a lot of uh, GPS signal available. So uh, to be clear, um, the trajectory on the left is reconstructed from um, data provided by a flight tracking app that includes um, GNSS or GPS fixes. There's some inertial coasting that goes into it. Um, the data are broadcast via ADSB. That's uh, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. It, that's basically a tool that allows um, air traffic controllers to see where aircraft are currently located, one of many tools they use, and uh, potentially uh, multi radiation depending on whether Cypress is equipped with it. Um, we're not clear and the exact mix of, of information that goes into this. But um, in the parts where we can uh, verify it against our own uh, GPS positions, it, it checks out. The key message here is, yeah, sure, GPS was actually par partially available. Um, and one of the things that happened on the cockpit is um, we were anxious to actually find some, some RFI, and we weren't actually finding it. When we were in this portion of the flight, we do some banking and we started noticing um, by looking at um, the display, you start, you, if you check closely and if you know these, of course, pilots know how to do this. Um, you have a very subtle indication here that you're being jammed. It says nav four, that means four satellites are currently in, informing um, the navigation solution. We have two receivers on board. The other receiver is already down to three satellites, cannot compute a position fix, and that's why it goes into aided mode. It's being aided by the inertials on board. At this point, we were still speculating whether um, the loss of satellites, we actually, some of us thought, well, maybe it's just due to the banking because we're banking aggressively. Well, later we see that that isn't the case. And uh, one of the things that we had available is, um, on, on the experimental MMR, we, we were able to read out power levels. And what you see in this slide is um, we have three constellations. We have top is GPS, middle is GLONASS, and the bottom is EGNOS. And each bar, each color bar represents power on a particular frequency. You've got three frequencies for some of the GPS satellites, two frequencies for the GLONASS satellites, and of course, one for the EGNOS. The first thing that happens is as soon as we take off is you lose EGNOS, you retain GPS and, and um, GLONASS. Eventually, um, GPS goes out the window and GLONASS remains, presumably for its um, FTMA um, separation of channels. But eventually also GLONASS goes away, we have to say. Um, and this is, you'll see we have a little bit of different results depending on what we're looking at, um, the experimental MMR on the aircraft or um, the commercial receiver. Um, the commercial receiver is, of course, uh, of higher grade and uh, newer model. So we'll see that um, a, I think we have a GLONASS satellite available at any given point in time. So that didn't lose all GLONASS satellites. A little bit of differences in receiver architecture and whatnot. But yes, if we look at um, the power levels on the MMR, this is GPS only again, um, they're partially available. And what you need to see here is um, the big clusters at the beginning of the flight and at the end of the flight are, of course, the time on the ground spent taxiing, takeoff, landing. And um, these other little bits and pieces of, of measurements correspond to the first picture I showed you of the um, GPS availability. 
again, um, this is how many satellites we can track for each constellation. This comes from, from the commercial receiver. You can see that GPS crashes from 13 satellites to zero very quickly. There's a bit more resilience on Galileo and GPS, um, probably due to the signal structure. Um, in the worst of cases, we see that there's a single GLONASS satellite available, and that's all there is. And um, because we have a high quality data recording device available, we of course um, made a spectrogram of it to try to understand what's going on. And it's, you know, any, anybody with a bit of experience in RFI will recognize that if you have a lot of power on the L1 frequency, that looks a lot like a jammer. Um, the structure you might recognize in that yellow um, fringe is is most likely aliasing. Um, we zoomed into it and you can see on the right, you can see a, um, the chirping of the signal over time. And we see that it's a textbook um, sweeping jammer. Curiously, it operates at L1, but not at L5. So, Mickey is now going to talk about what has happened after the flight test. He's done a lot of analysis of um, flight tracking data, ADSB data, and um, yeah, Mickey, take it away. Thanks, Aquari. Yeah, of course, um, that flight took place two and a half years ago, and um, quite a lot happened since then. So in March 2021, Eurocontrol issued a uh, think paper, that think paper number nine, um, about exactly this issue of RFI in uh, the Eurocontrol service region. Um, and they stated, and this was uh, actually uh, very interesting to me at that point, that almost 40% of the European en route traffic crossed RFIs that were known to be affected by uh, GPS jamming or, or RFI. These are the areas um, shown in red here, and uh, black are the flight tracks. Now, this was data from uh, 2020, where we know that uh, traffic levels were much reduced due to the uh, COVID pandemic, but still, obviously, the problem was there and the problem persisted. So then um, moving on to uh, this year, March 17th, um, EASA issued a safety information bulletin um, about, again, uh, TNSS RFI, and this happened um, yeah, you might already guess uh, mid-March after uh, the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, there were actually a lot of reports about uh, experienced RFI in uh, different parts of Europe uh, in, uh, for, for affecting air traffic. Um, that safety information bulletin by EASA um, also uh, went on to explain some potential effects. And that's just a short excerpt, so it's not the full list. But the first three bullet points basically mention the loss of um, ability to use GNSS for navigation, for RNF operation, and for um, RNP operations. And this is very consistent with what we found um, in the um, in our test flight when we flew to to Cyprus back in 2020. The list also mentioned um, two other things. The first one, triggering of terrain warnings. Now we didn't see that. That seems to be um, uh, gladly, uh, very much less common issue that uh, can pop up. Um, but the last point, loss of ADSB is actually um, a very uh, yeah, occurring very frequently these days. We did not see this um, in our test flight. And the reason is that at the time, our aircraft was still operating with an older version of the um, ADSB transponder, um, where the navigation information that is brought, so the position information that is broadcast by the ADSB did not yet have to have integrity. Now, today, this would look different. Um, if GPS is lost, there is um, almost no means to, uh, to ensure integrity. And at that point, the ADSB transponder will stop um, transmitting valid position information. So the safety information bulletin also went on um, with some recommendations. Um, especially for air operators. And um, I mentioned those two um, here because we took a closer look at those two. The first one being assess operational risks. And the second one is the recommendation to ensure that flight crews are aware of possible uh, jamming and or spoofing events. So we took a closer look um, at, at both points, even 
we're not an air operator really, but uh, we still found it interesting. So uh, in terms of potential risks, we took a closer look, uh, um, look at the um, risk for mid-air collisions. Now, what is that? So with GNSS, we're um, able to navigate very precisely. So we have very small arrow bounds. Whereas if we revert to DME, DME navigation, which was the assumption in, um, in this study, um, the navigation performance will degrade. So our errors will be much more um, spread out. So eventually um, we have two um, distributions and, and there might be a risk of overlapping, which would then constitute a mid-air collision. Now the results are shown here in, in that table. And um, the good news maybe first is uh, the, the number on the lower right um, for DME, DME-based navigation, um, we came to that collision risk um, and on the order of 10 to the power of minus 18. And this was done by taking all the trajectories in, in the area you see in the, in the above picture over Central Europe, so a very busy airspace. And we took the busiest day of 2019. So it's really um, one of the days with maximum air traffic um, so far. And uh, that uh, number of 10 to the power of minus 18 is um, well below any target level of safety. So there is no need to worry. Um, there are two, um, two, two caveats, however. Uh, this, of course, means that we have to have a good network of uh, DMEs available. Um, for this kind of um, alternative navigation. And we also have to retain a certain um, network of, of ground-based navates that allows for um, accurate and uh, reliable navigation in case of a GNSS outage or um, RFI on GNSS. The other point um, that I want to mention here is if you Compare GNSS and DME, DME, of course, um, there is a difference. And that's also um, maybe one takeaway that for GNSS-based uh, navigation, the, the collision risk due to navigation errors was um, below machine precision. So we couldn't calculate it anymore. Whereas for DME, we could calculate it. So it constitutes an increase in risk, um, but it's not a very, a very significant one to levels of which would actually already be worrisome, which is... Um, good news and which is what we expected, but, but we wanted to confirm with this study. Now, the second part of the recommendation was um, that airlines should inform flight crews about potential jamming um, and spoofing. Now, in order to inform flight crews um, and, and prepare them for events, it's essential that the, the operator has that information about and the situational awareness about where RFI might actually um, pop up and, and where pilots should expect it. So um, I mentioned uh, those three main sources of information we have here. The first one being ADSB data. So this is kind of your uh, flight radar and uh, the likes, which is kind of operating in real time. So you have kind of a real time information about what's happening, which is good if the situation changes or changes um, from day to day or even from hour to hour maybe. A second source of information air operators have available are uh, reports from flight crews about their experience when, when they encountered RFI. And the third is um, flight data monitoring. So basically aircraft operators have access to a lot more um, detailed data regarding aircraft positions, kind of a bit what's stored in the, in the flight data recorder. They can download this um, post-flight and, and do some further analysis. So the first um, point is ADSB data. And um, there are even websites where you can go and, and check out the current situation. Um, this is um, a very recent example from last week um, where uh, some jamming suddenly started to appear in the, in the Dallas area. So here you can see it was 19th of October. Um, so ADSB is good for uh, detecting these kind of things um, really fast. But it's also um, a good uh, indicator to, to look at um, how the situation evolved over time. And we wanted to explore the situation and, and what happened in 2020. So we took the data from February till September or including August to the beginning of September um, of this year. And we analyzed the traffic that went through that um, red box here. So it's basically the airspace over Romania, Bulgaria, and Moldova. And what we found was this. So as you can see, it's not always the same. So it's frequently changing. 
there was a big peak or were two big peaks in the May and, and June timeframe where we saw a lot of jamming going on. Um, before and after that, we see um, spikes that come and go and uh, in between also times where it's uh, rather quiet. Um, on, the, on the left y-axis, you see the actual number of aircraft that were affected by RFI during one day. And if you look at the peak value in June, it's about 1,300 aircraft that uh, crossed that region um, and, and were affected by RFI, which is about 60% of the, of the total traffic that went through that area. Now, that percentage is a bit arbitrary because, of course, it depends on the, on the size of the box you choose. So if you narrow this down to an area where um, a lot is happening, then, of course, the percentage would get up. Um, but this is, this is basically showing the picture and um, giving a, a good indication of what happened. Um, so far this year. Now, I didn't tell you quite yet how we did it exactly. So as, um, as indicator, we knew, used one parameter from the ADSB message, the so-called NAC, Navigation Accuracy Category for position. And uh, we just simply said that um, whenever we have a NAC of zero, that um, and it was different before, higher before, um, then it um, probably was was jamming. This is not entirely true, though, um, because there are a lot of uh, subtleties to that. As we've seen uh, in, in Aquarius part, sometimes uh, you start flying into RFI or, or transitioning out of RFI, so you just lose some satellites. Your navigation capability might not even be affected yet, or you might just lose a few satellites, um, so you don't really uh, know what's happening. Um, so... Also, that, that parameter then would not uh, change very much. The second thing is that it differs a bit um, between aircraft. So the top plot shows the, the NAC over a flight from an Airbus A220. And you see that as soon as it is affected by RFI, the, the NAC drops uh, to zero pretty fast. Um, whereas in the lower picture, you see data from an A350. So a very modern aircraft with a very good integration of GNSS and uh, the inertial sensors. And you see that there is a gradual decline of the NAC uh, before it reaches a zero eventually. So depending on how long you're affected also for the A350, it might actually never reach zero. So it's just a proxy. Um, there are a lot of... Um, details to be taken into account. Nevertheless, we didn't uh, worry so much about those details because uh, we still thought that it's a reasonably good indicator for uh, getting that kind of situational awareness, not for evaluating that, um, that stuff in detail, but just to get an, an idea about the area. So the second thing I mentioned were flight crew reports. And um, the uh, here it is. A student of mine, a master student, he evaluated almost 800 of flight crew reports about RFI um, that were reported through the company safety management system, and he analyzed um, all the reports uh, from their Airbus fleet. And uh, what you can see here is the distribution. Um, of which faults occurred um, as, as percentage um, of, the, of the total 792 reports. And you see by far the most, almost 80%, is the ADSB reporting fault that was um, reported. So that's again, that um, fault we did not see um, on, on the DLR aircraft um, due to its older ADSB version. Did we take the aircraft and, and fly there or fly to some um, RFI affected area today? we would definitely see that our um, ADSB reporting fault as well. The other two faults, the NAF GPS faults and the GPS primary loss were um, exactly those effects that we also saw on the test flight. Um, the NAF GPS fault occurring twice as much as the GPS primary loss. All, um, also, this is consistent with what we found. So first the NAF GPS faults occurred and only very much later, um, as Okwari showed you on the map, the GPS primary lost messages um, appeared. And I already briefly touched on it, and um, I don't have um, any, any real results to show you here. But um, again, flight data monitoring um, of aircraft operators can also provide a valuable source um, of, of insights and um, quite interesting data. 
So for example, the aircraft has a lot of different position solutions, depending on which sensors they use. So GPS or the inertial positions of the redundant inertials, the hybrid solution, a radio nav position using ground-based nav aids. Um, and you can compare all those positions. And uh, once you transition into RFI, um, you will see there are um, certain patterns and, and certain jumps. So post-flight, it's possible to also have um, a look at the technical side. So this would be kind of the, the technical side, um, airline internally or air operator internally, um, internal to the airline, also the flight crew reports, which will give you um, more insights on the facts that actually happen in the cockpit. And um, for maybe further evaluations, also what this means for crew workload or crew distraction. So this whole uh, human factors aspects. And then the ADSB data, as we mentioned before, as kind of a real time um, information about what's happening in the airspace. So this already um, brings me to the end of the presentation. We've seen that many aircraft um, are flying through RFI affected airspace every day. And um, we, I think, can say with a good confidence that they do so safely, which is good news. Um, some pilots do report uh, GNSS outages to ATC, but uh, rarely because um, in many areas they just got used to it and it's uh, kind of normal there. And it's if they see a NOTAM, then they don't feel the need to report anymore. So some may be already tired of uh, reporting. But uh, we've seen that many do report internally, at least, um, as part of the safety management systems of, um, of airlines. However, these reports are usually internal and are not shared publicly. So um, there is a lack of information, and, and not everybody has access to that um, same information. We've seen that RFI um, has a very um, yeah, a big variety of effects, and it's hard to be uh, deterministic because it depends a lot on the aircraft, the integration, and also um, the, the degree to which um, the receiver is affected by jamming. And um, we can, but we can um, obtain situational awareness about those areas affected by a lot of um, different sources of information. So overall, um, permanent jamming reduces the redundancy of the whole um, CNS system and um, requires actually a very good alternative navigation um, infrastructure, which hampers the, the rationalization and, and therefore increases cost, lastly. Um, and there are also aircraft that are not as well equipped as those large uh, commercial aircraft, uh, so the, the, the airliners. Um, and, and those smaller aircraft may just rely on GNSS only for navigation. And uh, these would be seriously impacted and may even require then ATC involvement. And um, that would also create then workload, um, additional workload for, for ATC. And with this, um, one last word, special thanks uh, go out to Gary Bertz and Vali Vitan of Eurocontrol and their team. Um, they supported us a lot in setting up um, this flight and, and the coordination, um, brought us into touch uh, with the DCA and the DC in, uh, in Cyprus. And um, of course, also a big thanks to the whole uh, flight crew that was involved in the, prepare, in the preparation and the execution of the flight. Thank you very much for your attention and we'd be very happy um, to at least try and answer uh, some of your questions you might have. Thank you. Ah, oh, here's one. That's about your part. You mentioned that it was surprising that L1 was jammed, but not L5. Why is this? Why is it surprising or why is L1 jammed and not L5? I think it's... Um, you, can, you can answer both. <laughs> right, let's try that. <laughs> I found it surprising that L5 isn't being jammed because um, I would assume that the origin of the jamming is of a military nature and leaving the L5 capability open to the potential adversary, and I'm speculating here a lot about how this is being used, um, would still leave, leave them a lot of leeway in providing position solution to its systems. That's why I found it surprising. Why is it not being jammed? I actually don't even, have an, uh, a hypothesis on that. I don't know, Michi, do you want to 
take that version of the question? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, to me it highlights the cat and mouse nature of this um, of this work. Uh, as soon as um, the the whatever application of interest um, is being jammed, uh, you know the, they will start using a different frequency, and then the jammers will also catch up on that. I'm gonna click this as done. Yep. Oh yes. Okay. Thank you, Mika. And we have another one. Um, in the data you analyzed, were you able to find any precursor indications that the air crew could potentially use to mitigate any of the impacts and effects of the RFI? Yes, Michi, you go. It's your turn now. This is um, this is. <laughs> <laughs> you so can go all, back to the I, slide with Aiden, right? I I would not see um, that the that the flight crew would actually have any means to mitigate um, the impact of RFI. Um, except not flying through through that area, which uh, is operationally usually not an option, uh, and also usually not necessary due to the um, alternative means of navigation that are available. Um, is there any precursor? I um, well, as Oquari showed, if you monitor closely that uh, the navigation page, um, you see that the number of satellites used is, is slowly um, declining. So that would be an indication. However, um, that's a multi-purpose display. So usually uh, the pilots have the flight plan. Um, they're indicating the next waypoint. So that's not a, a page to have routinely open. So um, it's, I would say there is not much uh, indication beforehand. And uh, if there were, there is not much um, they could do to avoid it. I see somebody has their hand up. I don't think we can. Um, put the mic to them, Rick, is that right? So if there's a question from Roy Wagner, maybe they want to type it in the question. In the meantime, there is another one. When, yeah, when RFI is observed in the air, do you have any idea if it is or isn't usually observed on the ground level at the same area? So this depends a lot on um, where the transmitter is located and through the curvature of the earth, you will um, see it at, at higher altitudes um, further away, but not on the ground. So because basically you're, you're, um, you're behind the curvature of the earth. So if there is a transmitter somewhere on ground and um, then in Cyprus, you don't see it on the ground, but you see it when you're above um, in in the airspace in, in Cyprus. And that's pretty much what we saw. So it was roughly about 10,000 feet um, where we started um, tracking the satellites again. So below 10,000 feet, we started tracking the satellites again. There's a question about, does this problem have a common part with the interference between the 5G and altimeter? I would say it is a similar kind of problem where one system interferes on another, but um, it's a completely different frequency band because um, that's in the giga, uh, higher gigahertz uh, in C band. And we're talking about L band, which is around one giga, gigahertz. Next, um, Philippe Badia is asking whether we had a means to detect and locate in uh, RFI in real time. No, this uh, me, made me personally quite anxious that, <laughs> that we could <laughs> potentially be flying through, through the soap and not find it. <laughs> um, we have, uh, identified a number of confirmations of um, where some potential jammers could be in the area. There's some work by Todd Humphreys uh, of UT Austin. There's some work by Sabrina Ogazio at Ohio University that confirms um, jammers east of Cyprus. Is there any simulation platform to develop this interference scenarios? I mean, there is a lot of work going on um, of trying to make receivers more robust against interfering, uh, interference. So uh, I'm sure there's, uh, there's a lot of simulation also going on, but um, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky thing because um, the, uh, the effect, so the nature of the jammer, the power, its location, uh, this all has an impact. So there is a wide variety of potential ways to jam or, or spoof a signal. So it's, um, you, you can certainly simulate that, but um, it's uh, yeah, not necessarily representative of what you would see in, in real life operation. But I believe there are commercial products that provide this capability. Yeah. 
So there's strong effect in low latitudes. Um, depends if there are a lot of jammers in low latitudes. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not seeing the connection between RFI and low latitudes. So Teddy, if you could elaborate a bit on that. So there are, as of February, 2022, we're seeing that at high latitudes there are just as many jammers as at medium latitudes, right? Um, maybe we cannot wait for clarification. Do we have maybe, some more questions? Maybe, the, maybe the point is, uh, and and I'm just speculating here. So Teddy, please correct me if I'm um, speculating a totally wrong direction. But does this have to do something with um, distinguishing um, ionospheric um, effects from from jamming effects? That's the only connection to low latitude I could think of at the moment. Mich, I think the next one is interesting. There's it's a question about disappearing, um, disappearing SVs and um, RAIM. So what? Well, That's a good one. Um, um, I would say there was an integrity check that failed when we got the GPS primary lost. When the aircraft notices it cannot provide the uh, an adequate estimated position in certain EPU to meet the current operation, it triggers an alert. Now, that doesn't happen until your um, inertial solution has diverged, in which case um, this is about um, inertial coasting more than a RAM or P-RAM. Would you agree to my answer, Miki? I think so, yeah. And um, so we were not able to observe any um any actual rain output from the aircraft directly so this is not an output that we have access to so we don't exactly know what the aircraft does internally and how the fusion algorithms and everything works in place together um that's a well-crept secret by uh yeah but, but let's keep in mind uh, if you look at the gps solution we had 14 13 satellites in view and it suddenly drops to zero so um the drop is so sudden that um I think I would expect um, a RAM to, um, or, I'm sorry, RAM or PRAM uh, to not be the most helpful tool in that case. Did you record samples for the entire duration of the flight? Um, it was not the entire duration. It was, uh, but a big portion of the flight. Yeah. Finally, you have observed, uh, observed only RFI or also spoofing. <laughs> we have looked for spoofing. We have not yet been able to identify any spoofing in the recorded data. So that doesn't the... mean that we've looked, uh, you, you know, there might be techniques out there with which we can look that would change that result, but we haven't identified anything yet. And um, so we never observed any position jump to a location where the aircraft was not. Um, so we did not observe that. Um, if it was an attempt to spoof us. It was an unsuccessful event because all it did was, um, as you saw in that in that plot, we lost track of um, of all the satellites. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you both for your time. This has been Pleasure, great. Sir. We we appreciate your uh, your time and preparation and your time in sharing this webinar with us today. Uh, this re this thank webinar you, has been recorded and will be posted to our website. Um, at ion.org will also be available at the same site where you can download the full technical paper at navi.ion.org. Um, so thank you both and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You have a great Thanks, rest of everybody. your day or good night. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Also to Bye -bye. ION staff. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Ken. Thanks.